Hey guys, we're going to get started now. Good evening. Please confirm that you can hear me. Do me a favor and confirm that you can hear me. Good evening. I see we have quite a few people already on here. Let me just go through and um, see who's watching already. Just confirm for me, please, that you can hear me. Let's see who we have here. I see Emily. Hey, Emily from Kentucky. Haley. Hey, Haley. Haley is one of my regulars here. Haley has already passed her test. Congratulations, Haley. Um, Haley, you always on here. You, you want me to, I'm going to make you an ad, uh, um, a moderator. If you always want to join my live, since you're here all the time, let me know if you want to be a moderator, Haley, because you always here. You too, Veronica Dennis. This my two regulars here. I see Haley, Veronica Dennis, I see Yes Marie. She says she's been watching the videos all week. She's about to take her test on the 25th. Okay, Yes Marie. Shakira. Hi, Shakira. Joanna. Um, she's from Federal Way, Washington State. Vampy26. Okay, Vampy, I've seen you here before as well. Ty Asia. Ty Asia, where are you watching from? Um, Bella's watching from Washington. Okay, she's about to take her CCMA in one week. All right, Bella. Haley says she's still applying to jobs in the Bay Area. Oh, Ty Asia, she's taking from, she's watching from North Carolina. Waiting to retake your test. Okay, now Asia, okay. Um, Veronica says, good luck with your exam. Yes, Marie. Lita from Texas. Hello, Lita. Kalanda says, I've been watching your videos because I failed my test on the first attempt. I have to reschedule. Okay. So for those of you that's retaking your test, welcome. I'm, I'm hoping that these videos are helping you. Um, and just, I, I hope that you all have been paying attention to those areas that you fell short in at first. And I definitely recommend really um, doubling down in those areas that you fell short in. Um, Jacqueline Miller watching from Manhattan. Hey, Jacqueline Beth. Um, okay, say okay, you guys can hear me. Okay, good, good, good. Oh, Tasia says she can't hear anything. Tasia, um, looks like my sound is good. Uh, she says she can't hear anything. Um, okay, Karen from New Jersey. Hey, Karen. Uh, Kalanda, okay, she's from Florida. Patrika just wanted to say thank you. Oh, she passed with a 41. Congratulations, Patrika. Do me a favor when this video is over or on one of my other videos, do me a favor and, and um. Put that in a comment so I can screenshot it. I can't screenshot it from here. I'm on my computer, but um, I like to shout out people in my videos, which I'm going to do in a moment. So um, when you get a chance, just put that in the regular comments. Um, okay, Vampy says, my name is Fanny. Okay, Fanny. Sage, okay, you can hear now. Oh, make it with Juanita says she passed. Congratulations, Juanita. I remember when you first got on here. Congratulations. Mercedes is from California. Yes, Marie says, I love your teaching style. Oh, thank you, yes, Marie. Um, Jasmine is currently a student. Jacqueline is taking her test. Um, on a, oh yeah, that's right, Jacqueline. I remember you emailed me. I'm glad you made it. You're taking um several tests. Okay, I'm glad you made it. Um, Veronica, she's um taking her exam on the 15th. Oh, okay, gotcha. So you had to change it. Okay, all right, gotcha. Okay, currently working as an MA. Lisa's from Daytona Beach. She's take oh, she's taking her test tomorrow. Oh, let's oh, let's pray for Lisa. She's taking her test tomorrow. Lisa, I'm glad you're here. Um, Haley said, um, Miss K's video is very helpful. Thank, thank you, Haley. Um, congratulations. Veronica says, Congratulations to everybody who passed their test. Thank you guys for um tuning in. So um, while we're on that note of congratulating everybody, let's shout out some of these people here. We have Paige who passed her CMA, even though my um, videos are for CCMA and CMAA, I have had quite a few people who said they've um, also passed the RMA and CMA as well. So that's good to know. Jade, we have Kendra, um, my name twin, um, Jessica, congratulations, Tara, I don't know if that's Tara or Tara, um, Daniela, we have Kay Pass, um, Cassandra, Bellum, Congratulations to Kayla, her name. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing any of these names wrong. I'm so sorry. Margaret, Tanisha, Dominique. We have Diana, Johanna, Chanel, Sandra, Haley. Haley is also in the comments. Congratulations. Haley was one of the ones who, who said she had to take hers a couple of times, which is common. It's very common. So Haley, I'm very proud of you. Um, Brianna, we have Jacqueline, uh, Q, Odette. Cassidy, so many people passing their tests. Ariel, Life of Lonnie, Lindsay, Sarah, congratulations. Pretty Lady Day. I had to comment her because I loved her energy. 
she had um told me she was um taking her test tomorrow morning and she came back she says i'm back i passed with a 424 due to the nha study guide ruin your vids and study guide i found online um they had the exact material on a test let's go and then i love how she came back and said uh this thing is in a way let me try to move this out of the way let's see if that does it let's see I don't know. Okay, she kind she came back and said, CCMA talked to me nice. I love it. I love her energy on that. So I just wanted to congratulate everybody. So as you guys pass, make sure I see you guys put in the in the um in the live chat that you pass. Also comment on the video so send me an email so I can screenshot it and shout you out on my next exam video. If you sent me anything today, it was too late. I only were, um, was able to get up into yesterday so definitely you know look out in the next video i will shout you out kimberly said i finally caught you live i'm glad you made it let me see before we get started let's see who else we got in here crystal said she passed hers as well crystal make sure you comment that if i i think i may did i shout you on already crystal i think your name looks familiar i think i may have if not definitely make sure you put it in the regular comments as well tazana said she passed tazana if you want to be shouted out definitely put it in the same um in the in the regular comments as well jacqueline said can you recommend anything for the cpt so yes if you're taking it through nha on the nha website there's also a cpt cpt study guide as well so if you go on nha under um under um study materials there's a video on my channel i show you guys how to access the study guide um but yeah there's definitely one for cpt um, yes, Miss K, what y'all teaching is in an RMA CMA too. I've recognized some of the questions, explanation you guys. So that's good to know, Veronica. Um, so yeah, so even though I focus on CM CCMA and CMAA, a lot of the same material is also on the RMA and CMA, but the RMA and especially the CMA are more broader. So um, there may be some things that I don't cover that's on those tests. So I definitely recommend reviewing that specific material as well. Um, Haley says she has an interview on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, what's your advice? Um, Haley, let me, um, ask me that again at the end. I'll see if I got a few minutes to, to answer your specific questions at the end when we finish going through the questions. Um, or you can, um, let's just talk about it at the end, but I'll be glad to, um, try to answer a couple of your questions specifically about the interview that you have coming up. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. So a few tips, you guys can screenshot this. The tips are pretty much the same as um, I mentioned every single time we go live. So if this is your first time here, how this works. Um, I just give, I, I shout out people who recently passed. We go through a few of these tips here and then we go through the questions together. After I ask each question, I give you all a chance to answer in the comments and then i will reveal if you got the answer correctly so this is your first time welcome 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 um okay Van fanny says i graduated as a medical assistant but taking administrative okay gotcha so you're taking administrative test now i'm going to do another um administrative that's going to be my next live so the next live i do maybe next week i'm going to try to get uh um uh, get some slides done for the uh for part four of the cmaa all right guys so let's go ahead and get started um so make sure you screenshot this if you haven't already make sure your life is revolved around the study material you join medical assistant groups on facebook and network with other amazing the reason why i say that is because um when you go in those groups and you ask hey has anybody anybody had any um study advice you know study tips or study material for the test you may can you know get it from other ma's in the group you know, and so you just never know. That's why I always recommend joining medical assistant groups for networking, jobs, and everything medical assistant related. Pay close attention to the wrong answers on a practice test. Why? I'm going to point that out as we go through these today. Don't focus more on the questions than you do on the actual content. One of the biggest things that I hear people say to me, Ms. K, I did not see the same questions. Do not focus more on the questions. Don't try to memorize the questions focus on understanding the content okay Cre you can create flashcards have a family member quiz you pay close attention to each question and recognize keywords which i'll point out while we're going through this practice tonight use process of elimination i'll point that out as well answer the easy questions first the great thing about taking your test is that you have the ability to flag difficult questions and come back to them later why 
you only get three hours. Three hours sounds like a lot. However, I've had students who literally got down to their very last minute and still had questions to answer. So that three hours go by quickly. So flag your difficult questions that you need to spend time on and go through your easy questions first, okay? Don't use all your time trying to get through those difficult questions that you need to think about, okay? And spend some time on, all right? So let's get it started. Question one, a patient's hand becomes infected after an MA failed to perform hand hygiene before removing a patient's sutures. Which of the following torts has occurred? Has, was it negligence, assault, slander, or abandonment? Give you guys, for those of you that's new, I always get time to give you guys time to answer in the comments. And it's okay for those of you that's, you know, answering in the comments. If you get it incorrect, it's okay. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be shy about it. This is why we're all doing that's this is why we're doing this so that way you can learn the correct answer okay so don't be shy about answering in the comments even if you get it incorrect okay okay i see those answers popping up give a couple few more seconds all right looks like everybody's pretty much saying the same thing let's see if you guys are correct Oh, I'm sorry. I got this thing coming up here. Let's see. All righty. So if you said negligence, that is correct. Now, remember in the tips that I gave, I told you guys to pay attention to incorrect answers as well. Why did I say that? Because notice negligence was the correct answer, but notice that assault, slander, and abandonment are also options. When you guys are going through these practice tests, Pay attention to the wrong answers, too, because if it's an option, that means it's probably going to be on the test. So that means you need to know what assault, slander, and abandonment is. So whenever you answer a question, when you realize what the correct answer is, as you're going through your practice test, it's going to tell you which answer is correct, and it's going to tell you why it's correct. Pay attention to the definitions of the wrong answers. What is assault? So assault can be defined in a couple different ways, depending on which exam you're taking. For those of you that's taking a CMAA exam, um, assault is defined as a threat to hurt, right? It's, a, it's a, a threat or attempt to hurt. On the CCMA, assault is actually hurting, right? On the, CM, on the CMAA, the administrative test, assault is attempt or a threat and then batteries are actual touching, okay, on the CMAA exam. When you go to take the CCMA exam, assault is simply um, actually hurting someone. OK, so recognize that slander is false statements made by a patient. I'm not a patient. I didn't mean to say patient, but a person, period. OK, and an abandonment, um, an example of abandonment can be if a provider lets a patient go without notice. OK, um, all right. So make sure you guys understand that this is what I mean by knowing what the incorrect answers are as well, because if you see it as an option on the practice test, it's probably going to be on the test. That's a part of studying. OK, not don't try to memorize this question word for word. No, just understand what these options mean. OK. I went backward by accident. Sorry, guys. All right. Which of the following techniques should be used when preparing sterilization for hemostats before an invasive procedure? Autoclave, gas, dry heat, or chemical? Autoclave, gas, dry heat, or chemical? You're sterilizing hemostats. All right. Looks like everybody's pretty much saying A. Let's see if you guys are correct. All right. If you say autoclave, you are correct. So autoclaves use wet heat, right, to sterilize instruments. If you're you, if if an instrument like a hemostat um, is used to penetrate skin or tissue, it needs to be sterilized by an autoclave. Okay. Um, gas is more so for like larger surgical equipment, right? Um, dry heat is not effective um, in sterilizing. And then chemical is more so used um, 
for disinfecting, right? So disinfecting, and I think in one of the videos we talked about the difference between sanitizing, disinfecting, and sterilizing. Um, sterilization, that's going to be completely destroying all microorganisms. So that is the top, that is top notch, right? That is the um that is the um uh the uh what's the word I'm looking for? For lack of a better word, that's the elite <laughs> of cleaning, right? That's the that's the highest level cleaning, right? When you sanitize something, you're simply just reducing the number of microorganisms, not necessarily killing them. Okay, so sanitization, that's like the very minimal, right? That's, you know how you guys use hand sanitizer when you don't have access to, to disinfectant soap, right? Um, that's like the minimal. And then when you disinfect something, you do kill some of the microorganisms. And then some of them, you don't necessarily kill, but you uh, make them inactive. You render them inactive. Okay, so you got sanitation. Disinfectant is the next step. Sterilization, the next one. Also, chemical is used for um, equipment or instruments that cannot withstand the autoclave because it cannot be, um, it's not durable enough to withstand the heat. Okay. Um, Bella says she has a hard time remembering the difference between disinfecting, sanitizing, and sterilizing. So I hope that helped, Bella. I'll just go through it one more time. So sanitizing is minimal, right? That's the most basic, you know, when you don't have access to soap right? To disinfect the soap, you just kind of use hand sanitizer. It's just a way to reduce the number, right? Of microorganisms. Disinfecting is when that's the next step up. That's when you kill some and then some of and you kill most of them. And then some of them, you just render inactive, meaning they can't cause any harm, right? May, maybe still there, but they, they're harmless because you've rendered them inactive. And then sterilization is the complete destruction of all microorganisms. Um, Go Buck says, hi, Miss K, just joined. Thanks for everything you shared with us. 48-year-old mom starting a new career. I love it. Learning is much harder as an advanced age person. I understand. I have a lot of students your age, so I definitely understand. Um, I have people that have been out of school 20, 30 years, and going back is just, it's different. It's different going back. So I'm glad you're here. All right. So hopefully that helped. Next question. And uh, I'll, I'll I'll um, come back to that in a second. Okay. So which of the following actions should you take when discussing information with a patient about a new medication the prescriber, I'm sorry, the provider has prescribed? Are you going to instruct the patient to stop taking the medication when the symptoms resolve? Reinforce teaching about the frequency of medication administration? Tell the patient to disregard new adverse effects? Or will you tell the patient to modify the dose as necessary? Um, I was going to say, too, um, I'm glad you mentioned, Bella, that you um, about having a hard time remembering that. That is something you will need to know, ladies and gentlemen, because you will um, um, you, you, you will possibly see questions about disinfectant, sanitizing, sterilizing. So that is definitely something you will need to know the difference between. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Bella. And this question is another example of. Um, is an example of using process of elimination. Remember, I, that was one of the tips I gave. Some questions you may not necessarily be able to just answer right away. You may have to use process of elimination. So there's a few things, well, um, really all of them, you can kind of um, eliminate because it's considered practicing without a license, okay? So let's look at this. So the answer is going to be reinforced teaching about the frequency of medication. As medical assistants, we can reinforce teaching that the provider has already given the patient, okay? Now, why did I say those other options are considered practicing without a license? Because as medical assistants, we cannot advise patients. So A is, in, is advising a patient. It's instructing a patient to stop taking a medication when the symptoms resolve. We can't do that. That's the provider's job, right? We have to make sure we're acting within our scope. Tell the patient to disregard new adverse effects. We can't tell the patient, well, first of all, adverse effects, that means that the patient, we can't tell them to disregard adverse effects because that means we're telling them to ignore negative effects, side effects, and things like that. Patient has begun having migraines or, you know, vomiting and things like that. We can't tell the patient to disregard that. First of all, that's something a provider will address with them again. And then tell the patient to modify the dose as necessary, again, outside of our scope, advising. 
So certain things you'll be able to eliminate based on what it's telling you to do. We have to make sure we are within our scope of practice. All right, which of the following is the correct angle when administering an insulin injection to an obese patient? Is it 15 degrees, 25, 30, or 90 degrees? Administer an insulin injection to a patient. Okay, I see the answers popping up. All righty, let's see. I see a couple different answers. Let's see. All right, so if you answered uh, 90 degrees, you are correct. So let's talk about this for a, next, for a second. So insulin is given in a subcutaneous tissue, right? Now, even though subcutaneous injections are normally given at a 45 degree angle, when we're given insulin, we do give it at a 90 degree, especially with an obese patient. Why? Because that needle is so small. We need to make sure it's going into the into the subcutaneous tissue. If you give a, a insulin injection to an obese patient at 45 degrees, it may not even reach the subcutaneous tissue. You need to go 90. You, that needle needs to be straight. So that way it's going into the subcutaneous tissue. Now, 30 degrees, I noticed some people chose that answer. 30 degrees, we wouldn't do uh, insulin or subcutaneous tissue, a uh, subcutaneous tissue injection at 30 degrees, period. 25 degrees either. So 25 and 30, we can kind of rule out. Now, 15 degrees, we kind of go 15 degrees when we're doing like an intradermal because intradermal can be given anywhere from, from 5 to 15 degrees, okay? And hint, hint, you want to make sure you know that intradermal in case you see it five to 15 degree angle. Okay. All right. Which of the following statements by a patient indicate that he or she understands self-administration of insulin injection? I'll roll the bottle between my hands before drawing the medication. I'll blow on the site to make sure the alcohol dries. I'll consistently use the same site for my injections or I'll hold the needle at a 15 degree angle for the injection. Let's see. Oh, okay. I, okay, Veronica, she said, oh, I, I'm, I'm guessing you mean intramuscular. You meant um, uh, uh, intramuscular is 90. Yes. Um, thank you for mentioning that. So, Veronica, are you saying intradermal, but I'm sure you mean intramuscular. So, intramuscular is 90 degrees, and so that's why she didn't choose that. So, yes, that's correct. Intramuscular injections are given at a 90-degree angle, Um subcutaneous are given at 45 except when it's insulin when it's insulin is given at um 90 degrees and then intradermal is given 5 to 15. now there's one option you should be able to rule out just based on the last question so that's another thing too i want you guys to pay attention to so when you guys are taking a test if you know okay we just said that insulin is given at a 90 degree, we know it's not D because we already said that it was given at 90. So we already can rule out D, right? Okay, right, Veronica, I see, I, I knew what you meant. All right, let's see. Oh, I went backwards again. Sorry, guys, I keep doing that. All right, if you said A, you are correct. Let's talk about these. So. Um, first of all, let's talk about the ones we ruled out. We ruled out D. We know it's not D. C is incorrect because insulin, um, when patients take insulin, they have to um, um, give it to themselves every, what, uh, depending on how often it's prescribed as needed or maybe once a day or twice a day. If they use the same site every time, scar tissue begins to form around it. So C is, is automatically incorrect because we actually want the patient to use different sites each time, okay? And then B, you all probably, I'm sure you learned in class, you never blow on an alcohol pad because you can contaminate it with your saliva, okay? With bacteria in your mouth. So you never blow or fan a site 
to make it dry. So even if you didn't know the answer was A, this is one of those examples where you use process of elimination to come to the correct answer because we know everything else is incorrect. Maybe I didn't know it was A, but I'm going to go with that because I know it can't be B, C, or D, you know. So there will be some questions like this where, um, and some of you probably already knew, but there will be some questions where you won't know the answer and you will rely on first eliminating everything that you absolutely know that the that the answer is not, okay? So I will roll the bottle between my hands before drawing the medication up. Anybody know why we do that? You can comment down below. Why do we roll the bottle between our hands before drawing the medication? Why do we do that? I'll just wait just a couple seconds, see if anybody can answer. Why do we do that? Why do we roll the bottle between our hands before drawing the medication? Okay, I'm going to go to the next. I don't see anything popping up yet, but I'm going to go to the next question. I'll see if anybody, um, somebody says to warm it up. To mix it. Yep, to mix it. To mix it. To mix it well. To make sure it's distributed. Exactly. Karen says, so um, Karen says to uh, make sure it's distributed. Nisa says to mix it. Yes, especially if you had to, um, if the medication has been sitting or if it's a medication that you had to, um, um, that you had to um, mix yourself. Yeah, definitely. So we don't shake it. Some people would say shake, but they don't really want you to like shake it, you know, um, but you roll the bottle between your hands and make sure it's mixed well. Yep. All right. Where should an MA place the electrode for lead five? On the left mid axillary line, horizontal to the V4. On the left anterior axillary line, horizontal to the V4. On the left mid clavicular line, fifth intercostal space, or on the right margin of the sternum, fourth intercostal space. Take a moment to look at these and, and think about it. V5. Where are you placing V5? Okay, I'm seeing some I'm seeing some different answers. I'm seeing this B and C mostly. So lead five. This is definitely something you need to know, ladies and gentlemen, for the test. So if you if you don't know where those placements go, make sure you know where these placements are. Okay, because you have to know it. This is another example of another good example of making sure you pay attention to the wrong answers because the wrong answers are going to tell you where the other electrodes go, okay? So I hope you guys have pen and paper um, while you're going through, while we're going through these questions together. So you're making notes. All right. So if you chose B, you are correct. You are correct if you chose B. Now, which lead is lead is A, the, the left mid axillary line, horizontal to V4? That's going to be V6, okay? So V6, that is the left mid axillary line, horizontal to V4, okay? C, which one is C? C is actually going to be V4. C is V4. So the left mid clavicular line at the fifth intercostal space, that is actually the, the, um, the placement for lead for, um, for, for V4, okay? Now D... D, we all we already can rule that out because that's at the fourth intercostal space. So we know it's not D because fourth intercostal space is D, is V1 and V2. Okay. So again, A, which is the left mid axillary line, horizontal to V4, that's actually V6. Um, C, which is the left mid clavicular line, fifth intercostal space, that's lead four. And then D the right margin of the sternum, fourth intercostal space, that is V1. I'm sorry, I think I said V2. I'm sorry, that is V1. D is V1. I'm, I apologize if I said V2 the first time, but that is V1. Make sure you know those placements. I do have a video on this channel where I, I have a skeleton 
and I'm going over the placement. So you can check that out as well. I did not do the arms and legs because those are the easiest placements. I only did the chest leads because that's where people struggle. And you do need to know this for the test. Oh, Mariana, good luck with that. She says she has her exam on Tuesday. All right. Um, Mrs. F says she takes hers on Monday. I'm so glad y'all are here. I know somebody else, I think it was Lisa that said she's taking hers tomorrow. So you guys have tests coming up very soon. Um, people are telling you guys good luck, um, Mariana and Mrs. F. Um, she says she thought... Um, Bella says she thought D is V2. No, V. Um, so D is actually going to be V1. So, so think about um, when we look at our patient. So if we're looking at our patient, if we're standing in front of our patient, V2 will be our right, right? Remember, the patient's left is our right and vice versa. So if you're looking at the patient, you're facing the patient, you will put V2 on your right, but this, it's V2 is actually the left of the patient's sternum. Okay, so just remember that. So it's your right, it'll be on your right because you're facing a patient, but it's actually the patient's left sternum. Um, the right of the sternum is V1. Okay, so hope that helped. Do you think of it as the patient right or our right? As if we're, oh, I just answered that, Bella. I hope that helps. So, yes, when you're looking at the patient, um, when you're looking at the patient, um, yes, your right is their left and vice versa. Uh, Taija says she's scheduled for Saturday thinking of, re oh, why Taija? Why are you thinking about rescheduling? You think you're not ready? Um, Jacqueline says she'll be also know the colors of the leads. Um, that's a good question, Jacqueline. The colors, just in case, I don't think so, but I don't want to tell you no. And then you, they, you do have to know the colors. I do know that the colors are always the same. So I know in nursing, the colors matter. Um, um, so I don't know. I would say yes, Jacqueline. I don't want to say no. I would say yes. Um, more than anything, make sure you know the placements and then let the colors be maybe like a, uh, like a secondary thing you're able to recognize. I've never seen a question about the colors, but again, I don't want to rule that out because I do know with certain things, the colors do matter. Like on, um, what is it? The hard to monitors. They go by colors. Um, so, yeah, Jacqueline may know it, know it, but I've never seen it. I definitely don't want to tell you no, and then you have and you see it. Um, let's see. Okay, Nisa said yes. Colors are important. Okay, thank you, Nisa. Uh, Mariana says the leads are usually labeled with the V1, etc., but I'm not sure if they're on the exam. So, yeah, they will be on the exam. I know for sure. I, I remember when I took it, those questions were on there. And they're definitely on the practice test. I do know that you do have to know V1. You have to definitely know V1 through V6. The limb leads, which are the legs and arms, are, are a lot um, easier. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I didn't include that in my videos. I think I may do a real person now that I'm back in the classroom. I'll probably do an EKG on a real person now that I'm back in the building. Taja, oh, you said you feel like you overstudy, if that makes sense. Um, if you do reschedule, Taja, don't wait too long because you definitely want to test why the information is, you know, fresh. So I wouldn't wait too long. You know you, so you know if you're not ready. I don't want to tell you you are if you're not. But don't wait too long. Don't overthink. And sometimes you're ready when you think you're not. You're more ready than you think you are. So, you know. The colors are covered in the study. Oh, thank you, Mrs. F. So she said the colors are covered. Okay, so yeah. So Jacqueline, a couple people have said yes. The colors you do need to know. Um, the um, Bella said clouds over uh, grass, smoke over fire, and brown in the middle. Um, that's not for EKG though. Oh, that's probably for the um, halter monitor. Is that for the halter monitor, um, Bella? Okay, uh, let's go. We're going to keep going. I'll come back. I'll answer your questions. Um, I'll come back to some of the questions at the end as well, ladies. Okay, which of the following actions should an inmate take when treating a chemical burn? Apply ice to the burn, remove any chemical covered clothing, cleanse the burn with hydrogen peroxide, or apply an adhesive bandage to the burn?
Okay, she said that's a cardiac monitor we hook patients up to in the hospital telemetry. Okay, yeah, so yeah, you know, and those you do have to, they do go exactly by color. I know exactly what you're talking about, Bella. When I worked in cardiology, it's been some years now, and it's been about it's 2022 now, it's been about um, almost five years since I worked in cardiology, and I did have to hook those up to patients. I know exactly what you're talking about, and they go by color. Um, okay, let's see. Seeing some mixed answers here. Oh, wait a minute, guys. Hold on one second. Okay, all right. So if you chose B, you are correct. So why is it not A? Well, first of all, it's B because you want to just kind of get that off the patient. That's the only correct answer out of all of these. Um, um, ice to the burn. If anything, you want to uh, apply cool water, not ice. So if you get a burn, not ice, you want cool water. Cleanse the burn with hydrogen peroxide, maybe at some point, but before anything, you want to cool it with water. So that's not going to be like the first thing you do or an issue thing you do is put peroxide on it. Eventually, maybe later, but you definitely want to cool it, um, cool water Get the chemical club cover cloven off first. Why? Because we don't want the chemicals to get um, to spread, right? We don't want it to get on multiple parts of the body. Okay. So we want to try to get that, that clothing off as soon as possible, even if we got to cut it off. Um, apply an adhesive bandage to the burn. Um, no, we're not going to do that either. Um, we can eventually apply a sterile dressing eventually, um, but now we're not going to put an adhesive bandage to the burn. Um, Nisa says, yes, what I was thinking, ice as a water, but yeah, I chose B, then I said A. Yeah, so it's going to be cool water. So ice, we can we can rule that out. So go ahead and rule that out, ladies and gentlemen. Ice, rule that out. If anything, you want cool water, but not ice. You just want to cool it off. That's the first thing you do with a burn. All right. Which of the following describes the dorsal recumbent position? Lying face down with the legs supported by the table. Lying face up with the legs bent and feet flat on the table. Sitting upright with the table at 90 degrees. Um, or sitting semi-upright with the table at a 45 degree angle. And yes, you do need to know these positions. So this is another one. Another great example of making sure you understand those wrong answers as well, because the wrong answers are going to tell you um, the name of the other positions that you need to know. So I'll give you those once we reveal the correct answer. Again, I hope you guys have like a pen and paper as you're going through these questions. <clears throat> Um, who on here also has access to the study guide and um, study practice says you guys know these questions I get directly from um, from the practice test. I have access to NHA. I don't have access to um, the CMA or RMA, but this is literally where I get this the information from. Who who has access to that? If you do, make sure you're you know utilizing it, taking advantage of it, paying attention to those areas where you fall short. All right, let's see. I'm seeing mostly bees. Let's see if you guys are correct. Okay, Bella says she has a study guide. Okay, good. All right, let's see. All righty, so if you chose B, which it looks like everybody chose B, you are correct. So I'm glad to know you guys know what the dorsal recumbent position is, dorsal recumbent position. All right, so what's A? What is lying face down with the legs supported by the table? That's going to be prone. That's going to be the prone position. So if you are lying face down with the legs supported by the table, you're lying face down, that is prone, okay? Um, C with C, sitting upright at a 90 degree angle. That's going to be the Fowler's position, okay? That's the Fowler's position, sitting straight up, sitting upright with a 90, at a 90 degree angle. That's Fowler's. Um, and then what is D sitting semi upright at a 45 degree angle? That's semi fowlers. Okay. That's semi fowlers. Um, so make sure you know those. Let's see. Um, 
can you save this live? Oh, Antoinette, definitely. This is always saved on my channel. This is, and actually this is part five to the CCMA. So if you haven't watched the other ones, make sure you check those out as well. This is part five. So yes, this will be saved. Um, okay, as well. Okay, so you guys do have access. Oh, you have Kaplan. Okay, if, if that's the test you're taking, go Bucks, then that's then yes. How different are the questions from the NHA exam? Like way harder or not so? Um, different from what, Mariana? Are you saying um these practice questions? So if you're talking about the practice questions from the actual exam, the practice questions will be different. And so um I reiterate to um not look for the actual questions the 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 material so you see how this question just said describe the dorsal position which one describe, describes the dorsal recumbent position you may not see this exact question but it may say which position um what is the position called when a patient is lying face up with the legs bent and feet flat on the table so it may switch it around you know what i mean so the questions won't be exact but the information will definitely be on there. So you just want to make sure you know, okay, let me recognize dorsal recumbent position when I see it. Let me make sure I know this one is prone and let me be able to recognize prone when I see it um, defined, right? Or it may say which position is sitting up right at a 90 degree angle. You got to make sure that you know that's Fowler's. So yeah, it's the questions will be, be switched up, but the information will still be the same. Um, if Hopefully that's what you were asking. Beth says we do one practice test a week in school. Oh, that's good, Beth. We graduate on August 18th and take the test on 19th. So that is really good. Um, with my students, um, Beth, we would do the same thing toward the end of, of the course. We would They get six practice tests, and we would do like one or two um, a week, and then um, they would save one for the night before the test. Okay, Veronica says she has access to NHA and RMA. Oh, good, Veronica. You have RMA as well. That's good. Um, that's a test or practice that you must purchase. Yes, you do have to um, purchase it unless your school provides it for you. So if you're fresh out of school, you can see if they provide it. If not, if you're going back to take your test and they didn't provide it for you, you do have to buy it. It's on the NHA website. Yes, Antoinette, it'll be safe. Okay, just because I'm a tie. Okay, and I'm hoping the way they're written aren't Oh, okay. I see what you're saying, Mariana. Okay. Yeah. Um, by the way, your name is similar to one of my sisters. One of my sisters' name is Mariama, Mariama. Um, but um, yes. Yeah, so the questions, it's going to be the same information, but it's going to be changed up. As long as you know the information, you'll be fine. And you may see some of the same questions. So I have had people tell me they saw the same question. So you know, some questions you may see, I just don't want you guys to expect it and get caught up on looking for them. I would rather you expect not to see them and be pleasantly surprised than to expect it and then you don't see any and then that's what you were counting on. So I hope that makes sense. Um, it's through NHA, but you t uh, purchased Kaplan. Just found it on Amazon, but don't. Okay, it may be um, Go Bucks. It's hard to say. Um if, if you're noticing on the practice test that you've seen on Kaplan are similar to what we're going over, you may be good. I personally always recommend to actually go to the NHA website and get it, but you never know. You never know. Um, I I just recommend getting it straight from NHA. Okay. Same that we do one test. Okay. Three for extra for practice. Okay. That's what I did. Saving two for just before. Yeah. Veronica says she saved two just before the exam. Saving two just before the exam day. Kaplan focus on the CMA and RMA. Okay, you okay, Johanna said Kaplan is the CMA and RMA. The CMA and RMA is much more broader than the CCMA. I will point that out too. So it's a lot more information. So if you have Kaplan, that means you're getting a lot more information than what you need. So that's actually a good thing. You're welcome, Mariana. Uh, for NHA CCMA, Bella, normally you find out right away as soon as you finish. I've had some person tell me that they had to wait a couple days, but normally you find out as soon as you're done. All right, let's go to the next question. We got a, some more to go. I went backwards again. Sorry about that. All right, which of the following actions should the MA take when performing aseptic hand washing? Use hot water to wash and rinse hands. Lather in a circular motion with the fingertips pointed up. Open the paper towel dispenser to collect paper towels or turn off the faucet with a paper towel. 
You're welcome, Go Bucks. <laughs> Oh, hey, and in, in, in the indigo. Okay, so glad I caught this. Okay, you take it was on August 22nd. Okay. All right, let's see. So you're performing a septic hand washing. Let me go back here. Okay, let's see what we got here. Okay, saying mostly D. All right, let's see if we're correct. Yep, so that's going to be correct. Um, so A, most a lot of people go there, which I didn't see anybody right. Most people use go to A. A, we don't want it to be hot, hot. We want it to be like warm. Um, so that's why A is not the correct answer. B, it says fingertips pointed up. If anything, your fingertips will be pointed downward. And then C, we don't want to open a paper towel dispenser to collect the paper towels. Um, we want to, if anything, you want to do that before you wash your hands so you, the paper towels could be ready. All right. But which of the the, the following are correct of, of all of them? You definitely want to turn the faucet off with a paper towel. So if you have this question and you're, you know, we're kind of on the fence and don't know, which one of these answers do you absolutely know you need to do? And that is turn off the faucet with a paper towel because you don't want to turn it off with your hands and then recontaminate your hands. So always turn the faucet off with the paper towel. I went backwards again. Which of the following actions should the MA take after splashing a chemical in her eyes? Check the material use safety data sheet, call emergency services, complete an incident report or flush the eyes with tepid water oh mariana says she misread the answer it happens mariana just make sure when you're doing when you're taking your test just um you know just pay close attention because that's how the questions get you i will tell you one of the biggest things that my students tell me is that they they misread the question they were reading too fast they missed something they missed an important word so it happens though just be careful so the, the MA has splashed a chemical in her eyes. What is she going to do? What is she going to do? If you chose D, you are correct. So is she going to do any of those other things? After, yeah. But she definitely wanted to flush the eyes with tepid water. So when you got, and that just means like it's not, that, that just means it's lukewarm water, tepid. So listen, when you guys have questions like this, where all of those are options that she, the, the MA may eventually do, or you see a question where, okay, all of those answers are correct. I'll do all of those. You want to choose the answer that you're going to do immediately after. So yeah, we know we're going to check the material safety data sheet, maybe, right? Because the material safety data sheet lets us know how to handle chemicals, how to discard them and store them and things like that, right? Call the emergency services. Yeah, we may have to do that. We may ha And we will have to complete an incident report because it happened on the job, right? But before we do any of that, we need to flush our eyes because we won't be able to do or see anything until we flush our eyes, right? So when you have questions like this, again, where you see that all of the answers can be correct it's something that you will do choose the answer that you're going to do first okay oh congratulations is that Nayla Shea Nayla Shea she passed with the forces congratulations um Nayla Shea make sure you put that in the actual um, regular comments as well if you want to be shouted out so that way I can screenshot it and shout you out okay all right which of the following medications is available in a sublingual form? Propranolol, nitroglycerin, metoprolol, or atorvastatin? They're telling you congratulations on a comment, Nayla Shay. I hope I'm saying your name right. Nayla Shay, Nayla Shay, I'm sorry. Another 
question where you well all of the questions you want to make sure you recognize the wrong answers to but definitely because these medications are listed you want to know what these medications are for because guess what if it's on here you'll probably see a question about it so someone asked um i think it was uh mariana you asked if the same questions will be on here this is a perfect example of the information of focusing on the information because it may not ask which medication is a sublingual form it may ask well i'm going to tell you guys the right answer in a minute and then i'll tell you another way they might ask this question all right let's see all right so if you chose nitro you are correct that is in a sublingual form so now let, let me tell you guys what propranolol, motoprolol, and atorvastatin is. Atorvastatin, that's a cholesterol medicine. Make a note of that if you didn't know that. So as I was saying, uh, Mariana, so you may see a question that says, which of the following is a cholesterol medicine? You might see these same medications listed, or maybe they may have some other ones. But guess what? Now that you know that atorvastatin is a cholesterol medicine, it doesn't matter how the question is formed because you know that atorvastatin is cholesterol. Propranolol and metoprolol, those are both used for, those are both high blood pressure medicines. They also treat heart disease. They are called beta blockers. So that is a good thing to know as well. When you see those, um, um, these medications, propranolol, metoprolol, there's another one, atenolol. Those are beta blocker medications that are used to treat high blood pressure and heart disease. Okay. Not Tylenol. It's not the same as Tylenol, which is a pain medication, right? We're talking about propranolol, metoprolol, atenolol. Um, there's another one. I can't think of it. Another alol. That's not Tylenol. But those are beta blockers um, that treat um, heart um, disease as well as high blood pressure, okay? And then the torvastatin, again, is cholesterol, okay? So make sure you know that so when you see it, you got it no matter what. And what beta blockers do, beta blockers, they pretty much, um, they, the way they work, they cause the blood vessels to relax, okay, um, and to dilate. That's how they help with, um, with blood pressure, okay? So those are beta blockers. So if you happen to see, again, if you happen to see the, a question that says, which of the following is a beta blocker? Okay, and you see one of those old laws listed, you know. All right. At which of the following times should a yep, vasodilator. Thank you, Bella. At which of the following times should an MA complete documentation in the MA's chart? Immediately following the procedure, prior to the procedure, during the procedure, or after completing all procedures for the day. Oh, yeah, Veronica says she was reading about the old law meds and they are for heart. Yep, exactly. There you go, Veronica. Yep. Those old laws. That's a that's a um that's a gem for y'all. Them old laws. Those are beta blockers for heart disease and high blood pressure. Okay. Let's see. Looks like everybody's choosing pretty much A. All right. So immediately following a procedure, we can't do it prior to a procedure. Let me tell you guys, while we're talking about this, let me tell you guys, because I've seen people do it. Don't, don't document before you do a procedure, because guess what? What if something happens and you don't do it? Now it's documented in the patient's chart. Do not do it. I've seen people do it right before they give a medication because they, they'll, they'll be like, okay, well, I know I'm about to inject this in a patient's left arm. So let me document it now. Do not do that because guess what? What if you document it? Something happens and then you forget or whatever, and then you don't end up doing it for the patient. It's documented in their patient's chart and it never happened. Okay. Do not document prior to a procedure. Do not, do not, do not do that. I've seen my co-workers do it and do not. Um, during a procedure, 
Um, no, because you're focusing on doing the procedure, right? So it's not doing, and you don't want to wait until after the procedure is done for the day because then you're going to forget. So you do it immediately following the procedure. Remember, if something is not documented, it never happened, okay? So documentation is very important after you actually do it. All right, which of the following is the most appropriate site to collect a routine CBC on a 10-month-old infant? Third finger of the left hand, median antecubital vein, cephalic vein, or the left heel? A CBC, which is a blood test, right? Complete blood count. Make sure you know that if you didn't already. CBC is a complete blood count. That is a blood test. You may see a question that says something like, which of the following is a blood test? And then you know CBC is a blood test, okay? So that's another example of knowing what something is. So that way, if you see it written, you know, see it in a question, you know it's a complete blood test. It is a routine blood test. That's where they go to look at your white blood cells, um, your red blood cells, and your platelets. Um, an internship, the physician don't allow you to record anything in a chart before they give the okay. Okay, so you're an externship now, Veronica? Um, and if that's how they do it, that's that's fine. If they want, if they want to tell you, go ahead and document it. That's how they do it. That's fine. Um, okay, another good one. Make sure you know. You guys know what the median antecubital vein is. You guys know what the cephalic vein is, the, the basilic vein. Make sure you know what those veins are because you will see questions about it. Make sure you know what the veins are. Make sure you know your artery sites, okay? These are things you want to make sure you know. All right, if you chose D, you're correct, the left heel. So if you didn't know this, make a note of it. 12 months and under, you're going to do their foot. You don't do their fingers or their arms, okay? 12 months and under, infants, you collect blood in their heel, okay? The median cubital vein, where is that? That's that middle vein, right? In the arm, in the antecubital space, that's that middle vein. The cephalic vein, that's in that, that's on the outer arm, right? So usually when you draw a patient vein, you always want to go for the median vein first, right? If they don't have that, then you may say, okay, well, let me check the cephalic vein. That's the outer vein, the basilic vein. And I, it sounds like I'm saying pusilic, but it's basilic. It's on the inner arm. That's that vein in the inner arm, okay? So make sure you know that. Make sure you can recognize those because if you get a question about that, you know where they are. Median cubital vein is in the middle. Cephalic is on the outer arm. Basilic is on the inner arm, okay? Um, Mariana says she's on externship too. And if you have the chance to do it, do it. Yes, it's so helpful. Yeah, um, most programs you have to do externship. You won't even complete the program until you do. Okay, are they hiring Veronica? She says she has two weeks left. I hope they hire you. All right. When witnessing the patient sign an informed consent, which of the following is the assistant's responsibility to ensure the patient understands the procedure, validate the patient's signature, evaluate if the patient is competent, recommend alternative treatments to the patient. This is another one where you can rule some of these answers. You could just rule out because it's outside of your scope. You can't be acting outside of your scope. Some of these duties are the responsible are the responsibility of the of the provider. And while we're talking about informed consent, this is something you will see on the test as well. What is an informed consent? When a patient is signing an informed consent. What are they signing? That is the consent that they're signing to acknowledge that they understand the risk and benefits of a certain procedure, right? They understand the risk benefits of a certain procedure. And so as the witness, I well, see which answer is correct. As a witness, your job is to validate the patient's signature. Anything else, you're acting as the provider, ensuring the patient understands the procedure. That's what the provider does. They explain the procedure, make sure they understand. They ask questions. If a patient has questions, okay, let me get your provider for you. Evaluate if the patient is competent. That's the provider's responsibility. Recommend alternative treatments. Oh, now you're treating the patient. You're giving them alternate, alternative treatments. You're acting without a license, and that's a criminal offense. 
Yes, it is a criminal offense to act without a license. Okay. Oh, yeah. She's up for hire for her certificate. Yes, Veronica. We are wishing you the best for, for that. She is up for hire on her externship. Please keep me posted on that, Veronica. Veronica is one of my day ones. She, ever since I've been going live on this channel, she has been here. That's why she's about, I'm about to make her a moderator on this channel. If, if you will accept, Veronica. Um, so, yes, we wish you the best with that. All right, which condition is likely to occur when a patient becomes pale and diaphoretic during a routine vena puncture? So you're drawing a patient's blood. She or he becomes pale and diaphoretic. What is diaphoretic? You need to know what that means. Sweaty. If you don't know what that means, write it down. Add it to your notes. You need to know that because that may be a question too. This is an example of making sure you know the material. Okay? Diaphoretic. Sweaty. Perspiring. And another example of um, one of these answers are the correct answer, right? So that means three answers will be incorrect. So that means you need to be able to recognize all of those because guess what? If it's an option, it's going to be on a test. So you need to know what each of these um, manifest as or what what each of the, the symptoms, what the symptoms are for each of these um, conditions, right? All right, so syncope. So syncope, what is syncope? Feigning, right? So if a patient is pale and diaphoretic, most likely they are going to faint, okay? Which is called syncope, all right? Um, seizure, you guys know of seizure, the patient is having involuntary movements, right? Um, nausea, the patient may feel lightheaded or queasy, okay? And then with shock, the patient may be cold or have pale um, or even sweaty, moist skin, okay, if they're experiencing shock. So they'll appear cold and as well as they'll be pale and sweaty, okay? So make sure you're able to recognize those. So just in case it's written differently and it says which of the following means that a patient is having voluntary movement, you know, it's a seizure, right? If a patient is feeling lightheaded or queasy, you know, that could be nausea, right? Let's see. Um, lovely Linus, congratulations. She passed with a 440. Congratulations. Lovely Linus, if you want to be shouted out, make sure you write that in the regular comments on this video or another video so that way I can screenshot it. Which of the following refers to difficulty breathing? This ipnea, euipnea, pneumothorax, or pneumonia? Difficulty breathing. They're telling you congratulations, lovely Linus. Difficulty breathing or abnormal breathing. Difficulty or abnormal breathing. Um, one other thing I want to point out to you all is make sure, um, I know I've said several times before, make sure you're studying everything. But when you guys know, you know, your medical terminology, make sure you're studying those, you know, um, your medical terminology, because that's going to help you a lot too. So if you happen to see a question you know, and you don't know the answer, but you're able to work it out because you know medical terminology, right? So for an example, this answer is dyspnea, right? If you know that dyspnea means abnormal, right? Then you know, okay, so if a per and you know that EU, U means normal, you can rule that out because you know U means normal, so it can't be difficulty breathing because it's normal. So make sure you guys are studying. Um, and then ipnea, you know, it refers to breathing. So it has to be one of these. Okay. So make sure you guys are studying your medical term because it's going to help so much. Um, neurothorax um, refers to the lung collapse, collapsed lung. And then um, pneumonia is um, inflammation of the lung. Is, uh, inflammation of the lung. Okay. So that's inflammation of the lung. All right. Which of the following actions should the assistant take when using a height bar to measure the patient's height? Raise the height bar when the patient is standing on the scale. Have the patient face the weight indicators on the scale. Have the patient stand up straight and look to one side or lower the horizontal bar gently so that it rests on the top of the patient's head. Yep. 
Um, hey, oh my goodness. Oh, Alejandra, you just made me smile. One of my students are on was on here. Hey, Allie. So guys, that's one of my current students, my real students. So she, I'm I'm teaching um an intro to healthcare class right now at a high um I have high school students. This is my first time teaching high school students, and she's one of my babies. Hi, Ali. I'm so glad to see you on here. You just made me smile so big. So Ali is one of my real students. Ali, and you got the answer correct. Yep. And I, I recently taught them um, medical terms. So I'm so proud of you, Ali. Yep. This is abnormal and ipnea is breathing. Um, Veronica says, I think if we know the root word, suffix and pre, yes, it's easier. Yes. So you can recognize words. The suffixes will tell you what, whether it's a procedure or a um, condition, right? So you, you can rule some things out that way. And also, um, the root word will tell you which body part is referring to. So like if you see something that says, okay, which of the following specialists would you go to for, um, let's just say, um, I don't know, um, cardio, uh, what is it? Cardiomyopathy. When you see cardio, you know, that refers to the heart. So, you know, it has to be a cardiologist, right? So yes, so important to recognize those words. All right. So the answer is going to be lower the horizontal bar gently so that it rests on the, on the top of the patient's head, okay? You don't want to raise the bar while the patient is standing on the scale. And the patient is not going to be facing the weight indicators, and um, they don't need to look to the side. Only time, let me just say this, B is never going to be the correct answer on the test, but sometimes I do have my patient face it if they have a hairstyle. Let's just say their hair for the women is sitting on top of their head and you can't put the bar on their head. Um, sometimes I do have them face forward, you know, sometimes you got to kind of make it work so you can get that bar sitting on top of their head, but B, it will never be the answer on the test, but just wanted to put that out there in case you ever have a situation where the patient's hair is on top of their head. All right, which of the, uh, oh, I went backwards, sorry. Which of the following should an assistant report to a provider prior to a patient's follow-up appointment? Anthropometric uh, measurements? the date of an upcoming mammogram appointment, recent laboratory results, or change in the patient's insurance policy. Prior, the patient is coming in for a follow-up. So if they're coming in for a follow-up, that means the patient was recently seen. Which one should you report to the provider? <laughs> Patient coming in for a follow-up prior to the appointment, which one would you report? All right, let's see. Yes, recent lab results. So A, anthropometric, that just means the height and weight, right? So we can't do that prior because the patient isn't in yet. We want to take those measurements when they come in. They're coming in for a follow-up. So that means the doctor, they were seen recently and the doctor most likely ordered, re, ordered labs for them, okay? And insurance policy, we can definitely rule that out. I'm gonna tell you guys, the providers, they don't wanna know nothing about the insurance, the money and all that stuff. I know at, at, at least doctors I've worked with, they don't care, they, they have billing for all of that stuff. Unless you work in a private office and a doctor is very much involved in that process and the billing process, they don't want to know anything about that stuff. So I'm going to rule that one out. But definitely recent labs. All right. How many characters are used to provide the highest level of specificity with an ICD-10 code? Two characters, four, five, or seven. You want to be as specific as possible. How many characters are you going to use with an ICD-10 code, diagnosis code? You're doing some coding, diagnosis coding, right? You're doing some diagnostic coding. Is it going to be two, four, five, or seven characters? Two, four, five, or seven. Oh, Karen, she put, she, <laughs> she, she Karen put B several times. I guess you're yelling. Karen is like, I'm sure about this. All right, let's see. 
the more characters, the more specific a diagnosis code is. So seven characters. The diagnosis code member can be anywhere from three to seven characters. The more characters you have, the more specific it is, okay? Now, when it comes to a CPT code, you may add two extra characters to modify it, okay? But with diagnosis coding, ICD-10 coding, the highest level will be seven characters, okay? Um, Karen said, I thought it was a CPT code. Good, good point. So CPT code will be an extra two characters. So that means the CPT code already has five characters, right? You add the extra two characters to modify it, but... I'm glad you brought that up because the difference between adding um, extra characters with a CPT code and ICD-10 code is that when you add more characters to the ICD-10 code, you're making it more specific. When you're adding modifiers to a CPT code, you're adding more information about it. So that more information will um, indicate special circumstances, like maybe more than one provider was used or maybe something was done in more than one location or something happened during a procedure unusual so that's the difference the icd-10 code it makes it more specific when you add characters when you add modifiers on the cpt code it just adds more information about it okay so i hope that helped you karen um Oh, Dolly's taking hers. Oh, yes, Dolly. Okay, I see I see that you scheduled with me. So we will be talking tomorrow. And I want to talk more about that at the end of this too, about the one-on-one -on -one sessions that I'm doing now, guys. But yes, I will be talking to you. And do me a favor, favor, Dolly. I noticed that you put on there that you had questions about the test. If you can, and I was going to email you actually um, tonight or tomorrow morning to let me know anything specific so that way i can i just want to make sure i'm prepared because if it's something i need i haven't seen in a while that i need to look up myself or you know i just want to make sure i'm um ready okay I'm, I'm ready for when we get on so anything specific that you have questions about email me okay um five is the primary cpt code with the modifier is seven that's correct so CPT codes is five digits. The, the two extra codes are modifiers to add more information, not to specify it, but to add more information about the procedure. Those are test questions. Hint, hint. When administering heparin subcutaneously, which of the following actions should the assistant take? Spread the skin taut over the injection site. Insert the needle at a 30 degree angle. Inject the medication slowly. Massage the site after removing the needle. Thank you, Dolly. I'm hoping I'm saying your name right. What I noticed we're using the ICD-10 CM code. You can't use a decimal to get the right diagnosis. You must drop the decimal. Hmm. I'm not sure what you meant by that, Veronica. Um, I know the the decimal. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. The decimal you the you gotta keep the decimal there because it it may mean something different without it. I'm not exactly sure. <clears throat> All righty, let's see. Hey, Yannette, there's another um one of uh, an, another one of my um YouTube friends that I recognize. Nice to see you. All right, let's see. Inject the medication slowly. So B, we can rule out, right? Because we already said 30 degrees is not an angle that we're using anyway, right? Spray the skin taut over the injection site. We do that when we're doing TB, TB tests. We want to taut the skin, right? When we're doing TB tests or when we're, you know, um, or when we're drawing blood. Um, and then D, we don't want to massage the site after removing the needle because it can cause a patient to bleed out. Now, if you're given a vaccine intramuscular um, in the intramuscular, um, doing the intramuscular route, we do massage it because we want to make sure the medication, you know, is evenly distributed. But when you're given something like heparin subcutaneously, you just want to inject it slowly and don't massage it after the after the needle, uh, after you remove the needle. Okay, heparin is a blood thinner. Okay. Um, I see. Hello. I see. 
Hold on one second, guys. Okay, sorry about that. I'm back. Okay, yes. Yeah. So you want to inject slowly, but with um, blood thinners, you're not massaging the site after removing the needle, okay? Um, I've had students before choose that one. That's why I wanted to reiterate that. All right, which of the following can interfere with the results of a pap smear? Engaging in intercourse 48 hours prior to the test, dushing one week prior to the test, using an over-the-counter vaginal cream prior to the test, or taking a prescribed oral birth control pills. Interfere with a pap smear. <laughs> Looks like everybody's pretty much choosing the same answer. Let's see. Yep, that oh, I went backwards again. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> so if you chose C, that answer is correct. So um, with intercourse, it's actually about um, 24 hours prior, not 48 hours that would interfere with the past mirror. Dushing is more like a few days, not a week. So a couple of days prior, you shouldn't dush. And birth control doesn't have anything to do with it at all. But over-the-counter vaginal cream, yes, definitely. Okay, so again, in the course, it's 24 hours. Dishing is a couple of days. Birth control pills, not at all. But over the counter vaginal cream, yes. All right, which of the following dressing, dressings should the assistant use on a partial thickness burn? Skin closure application, non adherent dressing, lubricated mesh gauze, or sterile gauze dressing? So partial thickness. One thing to make a note of this, um, that's when it's like a um, second degree burn, right? Second degree is the top two layers of the skin. So make a note of that, that just so you'll know that just in case. Partial thickness burn, that's the top two layers of the skin, aka the second degree burn, okay? Just in case you see, just in case you happen to get a question about that, okay? All righty, let's see. Looks like everybody chose B, and you are correct. So the other um, skin closure application, lubricated mesh, sterile gauze, they don't give the um, the air that this type of um, that this type of burn would need. The non-adherent dressing allows for air to get to the wound so that it can heal. With these other applications and mesh gauze and sterile gauze dressing, um, it is closed in, and it will not get the air. The necessary air that it needs to heal. Remember, some wounds require air. Um, wounds that may be um, like wounds that are draining will require like a gauze dressing, right? Because and it'll need to be covered up because it's draining maybe um, fluid or maybe blood. In cases like that, then of course they need like some type of gauze dressing, a sterile gauze dressing, right? But something like a burn, it needs air to heal. Okay. All right. Which of the following positions is appropriate for a pelvic exam? Another positions question. Remember, I told you, ladies and gentlemen, you want to make sure you know these positions. Is it lithotomy, prone, supine, or high filers? Lithotomy, prone, supine, or high filers. I know one of them we've already seen. And well, yeah, a couple of them we've seen in another question. So pelvic exam, lithotomy, prone, supine, or high filers. Make sure you know all of those positions. So if you know you don't know them, make sure you're studying that. When people always email, what do I need to study? Know those positions. Know those leads, placements for those um, EKG. Know your order of draw. I mean, there's so many that know your order of draw. Know your medical terminology. I mean, um everything those medications be able to recognize those medications that we mentioned 
know your your ranges so like your hemoglobin and your um what is it hematocrit all that good stuff potassium all that good stuff you need to know your ranges glucose all that good stuff make sure you know those all right let's see if you chose lithotomy you're correct yep that's used for pelvic exam so what's prone prone we mentioned that's when um you're laying flat on your line face down right so that's um they're looking at the back of the body right supine is when you're face up right so you supine you're laying on your back face up right and then how fowlers is when you're sitting up and this is good for people who has um shortness of breath or a head injury okay so we talked about fowlers uh and prone in previous questions supine if you didn't know that one you're laying on your back face up when performing a fecal occult test which of the following actions should the assistant take smear a thick layer of stool onto the test car window add the development region into the stool specimen read the test after five minutes or interpret a blue color as a positive result Okay, let's see. It's funny. I was just talking to my my students, my high schoolers about this, about um, having to collect stool specimens from the patient. Those of you in clinical medical assistant, this is a part of your job description, depending on where you work. So be ready. They will bring the sample. Well, they don't actually bring the stool to you. Uh, well, actually, in some cases, they may. Because if you have to put it on a car, yeah, in some cases they may. In some cases, um, depending on how your office is set up, in some cases they may take the car home with them and they may smear it on the car themselves. But either way, you may have to deal with some stool. All right, let's see. Looks like everybody chose D. Oh, yes, and you guys are correct. So the blue color will be positive. So A is incorrect because you just sprayed a little bit on there. Um, so it doesn't have to be a thick layer. So we ruled that one out. B, add the development agent onto the stool. So you don't put a development agent onto the stool. You put it onto the card. That's why that's incorrect. This is a good one. This, I'm telling you, they, they get you with the wording. So it will be onto the card, not the actual stool specimen. Read the results after five minutes. Nope, it's actually a minute. Okay, it's actually read after one minute, not five minutes. All right. Which of the following does the patient's bill of rights protect an individual from? Lawsuits when rendering voluntary assistance in an emergency, denial of care due to the patient's age, financial obligations incurred for health care services received, or releasing medical information to a patient's employer without consent. The patient's bill of rights. That's another one, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure you look at all, over those bill of rights. You'll see questions about that. Make sure you look over those Bill of Rights because you will see questions like this that will say, you know, and it may say which section of the Bill of Rights is such and such talking about. And, you know, so you definitely want to make sure you know those Bill of Rights. I'm seeing some mixed answers here. All right, let's see. So it looks like nobody chose A or C. You guys were able to rule those out. So A is covered by the Good Samaritan law. So if you are, you know, helping somebody in an emergency, the Good Samaritan um, Act actually protects you. Um, D, HIPAA. D is actually HIPAA that um, protects a patient's information from being released. So that's HIPAA. Um, C, nobody chose that one. I think that was kind of, um, we already know, right? Financial obligations, like they have to, like we don't protect them from that. Like they have to pay their bills, right? But um, Patients Bill of Rights, they do protect the individual from denial of care, discrimination, right? Things like discrimination um, protects them from, you know, um, uh, uh, like they they have a right to, to make decisions in their care. They have a right to, you know, um, 
to deny care, you know? So make sure you're you're looking at the patient's bill of rights and know what patients have a right to, okay? Um, nothing to do with financial obligations. Again, medical information, um, that's HIPAA, okay? All right, which of the following is a dissecting instrument? A retractor, a thumb forcep, scissors, or probe? Another one where you want to know what type of instruments you want, um, where you want to pay attention to the wrong answers and know what, what instruments um, each of these are, what type of instruments they are. I'll tell you guys, of course, once we reveal the right answer so you know, but definitely make sure. So if you're looking at this slide right now and you're like, what? I don't know what a retractor, thumb forceps, scissors, or probe is. And you know you need to study those instruments. All righty. Ouch. Let's see. All right. So if you chose scissors, you're correct. So what are retractors? Retractors looks like a little fork. That's what I say. Um, but those are used to hold tissue um, away from the site. So when a physician, when a surgeon is doing a procedure, Retractors, they look like little two-sided, like they looks like a little fork on both sides, and that is used to keep the tissue open. They come in different sizes. Um, okay, so thumb forceps, those are used for grasping and clamping. So forceps, period, are used for grasping and clamping, okay? So when you see forceps, those are used for grasping and clamping tissues, okay? Um, and then probes are usually used, like if you got to go into something, like if you got to, you know, if, if you got to go, um, pull something out of something or like a, um, form body from a wound or something like that, that's what probes are used for, not dissecting. Scissors are, con scissors are considered a cutting and a dissecting instrument, Okay. Scissors are considered a cutting and dissecting instrument because they have a sharp blade, okay? It can cut, it can dissect, and it can scrape. So that is considered a dissecting instrument. Uh, she said, I, I figure any forcep will be used. So forceps are usually used to grasp like tissue, so to hold something or to clamp onto something. That's what the forceps are used for to hold something. Dissecting is like when you're, you're using something to scrape or cut. That's what they mean by dissecting. But it's okay. That's what we do this for. So for review, because a lot of the stuff you probably forgot. Um, to which of the following specialists should you refer a patient who suffers from fibromyalgia? Okay. Another reason why terminology is so important. Fibromyalgia, gynecologist, ophthalmologist, gastroenterologist, or rheumatologist. Fibromyalgia. Okay. All right. Let's see. That's a little mixed answers. Got a mostly D, C, a couple of A, a C, C. All right. Let's see. Now, this is one. Let's talk about this. Okay. So, first of all, algae refers to pain. Okay. So, terminology is going to be key in many of these questions, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Fibro is referring to what? The fibrous tissues. Myo refers to um, muscles, okay? But if you pay attention first to suffixes, a lot of times suffixes will, will reveal. Well, first of all, uh, I mentioned earlier the root word, recognizing root words like fibro, myo. Those are both root words. And sometimes I will tell you this quick terminology lesson. Sometimes you may see root words. Um, and prefixes used interchangeably. Same thing for suffix as well. So just 
recognize F. So fibro, you may see listed under prefix category as well as a root word. But fibro refers to tissues, myo refers to muscles. But this right here, pain, we know this is dealing with some kind of pain, algae, okay? Gyne, what is gyne? Female, gynecologist. We Most of you all are on here are women. So we already, we kind of probably already knew this by default, gynecologist, but gyne refers to female or women, right? So gynecologist, we're going to rule that out. Um, opto refers to eye, right? Opto refers to eye. So that's something to do with the eye, right? So that's an eye doctor. Gastro is stomach. So we know gastro is stomach. Entero, this is two root words in this one. Entero is small intestine. So this means that this doctor is a stomach and small intestines doctor. And then rheumatologist, rheuma, uh, well, rheumato refers to, um, refers to joint, okay? Rheumato, also author refers to joint as well. But this is why it's important, again, to make sure you um, are looking at terminology. So if you notice none of these, you you recognize, you didn't recognize gastroentero, none of this, Roma, you didn't know what that was. Fibro, myo, you didn't know what that was. Algia, make sure you're studying your medical terminology because that's going to help you with some of this these questions, especially with something you you never seen before. Let's say you never seen fibromyalgia before, right? But you recognize algae as pain, and you know fibro is fibrous tissue, or you know myo is. It's just going to be. I just say all that to say that you're going to be able to answer questions just just by being able to recognize certain terminology okay i promise you that's your foundation i was just telling my students this other day terminology is your foundation can other doctors treat it if diagnosed that's a good question melinda so yeah so if you go to like your primary care physician and you have fibromyalgia like when i worked in family practice i had patients that came in to see the doctor regularly for fibromyalgia they would come in for their medications yeah so that doctor you know, the, the family practice doctor internal medicine, they'll see them, but most likely, like if it's, you know, um, chronic, is going on for a long time, not really helping, they'll refer to a specialist because a specialist, you know, this is what they specialize in. This is what they got, you know, they went to school to become a doctor, but then they went and got even more education in that specific field. And so that's why they refer them to specialists because it's like, okay, I'm a general practitioner. You know, I do a little bit of everything. I need to send this patient to a doctor who specializes in this. Treating for symptoms. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's just pain. Like it sounds like a big thing, but it's really muscle pain, tissue and muscle pain. That's what fibromyalgia is, tissue and muscle pain. And it could be for, for different, a number of different reasons, you know, why a patient would have fibromyalgia. That was a good question. So thank you guys. Make sure you guys exit out of this, this chat and like this video. If you're not already, make sure you subscribe and share this video with your classmates and colleagues. I've got a lot of people to tell me they've been sharing the videos with their classmates and stuff. So continue to do that. I hope this video was helpful to you. For those of you, I know Lisa, I don't know if she's still on here. She's taking her test tomorrow. Good luck. Some of you guys are taking it this weekend and next week. I wish you all the best. Um, I don't know the next time I'm going to do another CCMA video. I know I'm going to try to do CMAA next week, the administrative test next week. Um, if you guys want a one-on-one -on -one session, uh, many people was asking me, they're like, Miss K, can I please, I'll pay you, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no. So I've had phone conversations with some of you guys and all of that, but I can't keep doing that so, um, because of time. So what I did was I just opened up my schedule a few days a week. I'm available, the description it, the link is in the description and all my recent videos. Um, and so if you want to schedule one with me and people that want to schedule one-on-one, -on -one, those are people that want me to like look at their resume and cover letter, like, and they want more specific help on the test or whatever, or they need to just talk to me. Like one lady, she says she just wants to talk to me about her personal life. She got some issues going on in her life. She needs some advice. So whatever it is, it's 30 minutes, it's $19.99, it's in the description box. Um, I'm still answering emails, so you don't have to book the one-on-one. -on -one. If you just have a simple question, you can just email me. But if you want me more um, personally, 30 minutes about whatever, school, life, tests, resume, cover letter, whatever, 
Um, you can link it. You can, um, you know, follow Dolly. I know you're scheduled for tomorrow night, so I'll be talking to you. All she said that you're the best. Thank you, Dolly. I'll be talking to you tomorrow. Go Bucks says, are you going to chat about the one-on-ones? Yes. Um, will there be another part? Um, I don't know if I'm going to do, I'm going to try. I can't promise it, Karen. I, I'm going to try to do part six to this before then. I will try. And I'm definitely going to try CMAA next week. Um, Beth says she do share with her classmates. Thank you, Beth. Um, Mariana, you're okay. You can book a session um, by going to the link in the description of this video. Um, you're welcome, Veronica. Thank you for being a regular here. Lisa says, thank you. God bless. Lisa, make sure you let me know right after you take your test tomorrow. Come comment on the video. And let me know how you do. Thank you for breaking out each wrong answer questions. You're welcome. Does anybody have any questions? I'll take a, well, I'll sit here for a few minutes and see if anybody has any questions. I'll wait a couple minutes. Um, by the way, was this part four or part five? This was part five. Let me make sure. I think this was part five. I, I hope I didn't mistakenly put part four. This this was part five, Dolly. Let me see. Oh, oh, no, this was part four. Oh, thank you, Dolly. This was part four. I'm sorry. I thought this was part five. Um, Let me see. Now I'm confused. <laughs> Wait a minute. I thought this was part five. Oh, no, this was part five, Um, Dolly. Let me change that in the description box on this on this video. This was definitely part five. Let me see. That was part three. I'm looking at my channel right now. Hold on one second. I'll come back to the chat box. Yeah, this was part. Um, now I'm confused. Yeah, this was part. Um, let me fix that. I'll, I'll edit it. I can't do it while I'm in the video right now, but I will edit it. Thank you, Dolly. Okay. Um, let's see any questions. I appreciate you. And your, oh, no problem, Veronica. I do this every day anyway. I teach every day anyway. So I'm literally just doing the same thing I do all the time. So I don't mind. You're an angel. Thanks for taking my time. You're welcome. Go Bucks. No problem. There's always, there's already another video. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so this is part five. How much of the administrative questions are on a CCMA, like a lot or mostly clinical? Thank you. Good question. CCMA is mostly clinical, Mariana. Um, there will be some administrative questions, like those insurance questions, like um, those um, coding questions about recognizing, you know, CPT, ICD-10 codes. There are some of those. Um, a few insurance questions, not a lot. Uh, that's why you definitely want to make sure you have that study guide so you can see the module on administrative so that way um you know that way you know exactly what to look for it's not a lot it's not a lot though um this helped me so much melinda yes i will keep doing it melinda can you or will you do a cp2 ekg exam review that's a good question Jacqueline. i don't have access to that material um i don't well i i can i can get access on nha but it's just i i barely have enough time for this stuff so i don't even I, I can't say I would never do it, but I don't see it anytime soon, the CP2 EKG, because it's it's a it's already a lot with the MA stuff and medical administrative. So I would have to go by those study guides and go through them and stuff. So I doubt it. Um, you're welcome, Jose. Yes, this is part five. Thank you, Veronica, and everybody else has been reminding me that this is part five in Dolly. Thank you. Um sound went off can you answer in the chat oh her sound went off let me um let me see how can i i can't even answer in the chat i'm watching from my other youtube channel somebody do me a favor jacqueline says she cannot hear if if somebody's uh if somebody don't mind if they can type back to jacqueline that i don't have access to cpt or ekg Oh, you know what? I can do it from here. Um, to CPT or EKG. All righty. Um, Mariana says, is it 150 questions or 180? So it's 180 on the CCMA um, on the... Um, if you're taking a CCMA is 180 
on the CMAA, it is 130. I've recently did a video breaking down each test and how many has what 150, I think, might be RMA. If I'm not mistaken, I, I can't remember, but I did put it in that video. Marianne, if you look on my channel, it's, it's a video that says the differences between RMA, CMA, CTMA, and so on. Um, and I did break down the difference between each test. But I do know for sure that 180 is on the CCMA and you need to have a five. You need to have a 500 as a perfect score, but to pass a 390, at least a 390. Thank you, Indigo. Says she just began watching live yesterday. Yes, I'm glad you caught it too, Indigo. Veronica says she read a clinical since she spent more time in clinical. So much to learn. Although Epic, oh yes, oh I, I love Epic though, Veronica. That's like one of the most. Um, if you if you ever get experience with other other EHRs, you will appreciate Epic so much because it's so smart. So many so many things in Epic. It's a lot to learn, but Epic is the best. NCCT questions? No, Ruby. Actually, I don't. I don't have access to that. Um, some of the same information is on there, but I definitely recommend going to that specific um, information, going to that specific website to get that that study information. You're welcome, Mariana. And thank you, Veronica. Do we have many questions we can miss on the CCMA? Do we know how many? Um, you know what? I went at we we figured that out. I forgot the exact number, but I will tell you this. You can you need a 390 out of five out of 500, and that equals to about a 78%, I believe. I think that's 78%. Let me see. I think that's 78%. So um, what's that? Uh, 0.78. Wait a minute. Uh, what's that? 500 times point. Yeah, so that's that equals to a 78%. So uh, my students and I, we were able to sit down one day and figure out how many questions that that was. I can't remember. Um, I'll I'll do the calculations again to see how many questions you can miss. That's why you want to go through all your easy questions first, Dolly. You want to go in when you go take your test. You want to go in. And go take those easy questions and then flag those difficult questions. Okay, 110 on a CMAA. Thank you, Yannette. Well, what would you recommend for CPT and EKG? Um, CPT, let me type back to her because she doesn't have sound. CPT and EKG study guides are on the NHA site. Um, yes, Epic is very smart. Very, very smart. She failed. Karen says, I failed the person before school. To, oh, wow, Karen. Okay. You know what? The positive part of that is that um, you got close, so at least you know you can pass. I know it sucks when you get so close and you don't pass. I like to look at it as the glass half full instead of half empty. I like to look at it as, wow, at least you got that close and you know you can pass. You know what I mean? You know the information. Um, but just make sure you double down on studying those areas where you fell short in. Miss K, I see you post a calendar link. Can you be reached out on this link? Or well, this is, that's the appointment link. Um, but if you want to email me, it's kheartcpr. Um, I'll add that to, um, it's a kheartcpr. So this is to ask a quick question, the KHRCPR at Gmail, or if you got a video suggestion, you can you can email me there. But if you want to do the Calendly link, it's for the appointment. How does flagging work? I'm scared. Oh, flagging, it's easy, Mariana. All you do, you're just, um, you hit flag, and it just allows you to come back to it. It allows you to skip the question and then come back to it. And the reason I recommend that is because um, you only get three hours to take the test. And you can do it in your practice test, too. You only get three hours to take the test. And um, so you want to kind of go through those easy questions and then come back to all the questions you flag. So that way, the ones you need to spend time and think about and, and you need to do process of elimination. That way, let's just say worst case scenario, you run out of time. At least if you've already answered all of the easy questions and you've gone through most of the tests, at least you still, you know, have have enough right answers to pass the test as opposed to 
you know, in the beginning, you're doing all your hard questions, you're spending all that time, and then you don't have enough time left to get to your easy questions, you know, hope that makes sense. So spend all your time um, in the beginning on your easy stuff that you can easily fly through and then come back toward the end is when you want to spend time on the harder ones. I hope that makes sense. You're welcome, Veronica. Okay, let's see. Let me just make sure I'm not missing anything before I end it. Um, I just wanted to make sure I took it. I know I haven't been on here live in a while, so I wanted to make sure I answer some questions here. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, good, Mariana. So we've been on for quite a while right now. Let me see how long I've been on here. I can't see how long I've been on here. But guys, just make sure um, you like the video if you haven't already. Um, and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you guys in the next video. I'm going to try to do some more um, content. A lot of people have asked me about dosage calculations. I've been busy since I'm back in the building now. So I will... Um, I'm working, I do have a video I started working on for that, the dosage calculation, which is pretty simple. I'm just doing it just for beginners because there are some dosage calculation questions on the test. So I'm just working on something. So I'm hoping to get that done, um, hopefully between this week and next week. So I could put it up next week. Kalanda says, is there a printable study guide? Yes. If you go on the NHA website, um, and under the, the study material, there's an option to buy a book um or you can buy the online study guide um and on the nha website is nhanow.com if you have any issues accessing the website i do have a video on here that says how to access the nha website but it's pretty easy you could just go to nhanow.com and it's like i think it's under study materials and then it'll lead you to buy the study guides there so you can buy the printed study guide all of the study, get, I think the practice says those are all online, but they do have a book version of the study guide. All righty. Okay. All right, ladies, I'm going to go ahead and let you all go tonight. Thanks for hanging in there with me. I will see you guys. So look out for the notification for next week. I will be doing the CMAA practice test. So even if you're taking the CCMA, I do recommend you guys getting on that as well. So that way you get that administrative part of the test too. All right, ladies, have a good night. See you next time.